So today's lecture is uh, RNN, recurrent neural network. Uh, we learned about feed forward and we learned about convolutional neural network. And now we want to learn about RNN in order to handle a new type of data when the data has, uh, basically when the data is sequential. Uh, when you have, when, when the data is not IID, data is temporal, you know, and you want to make a decision based on not only the current observation, but the observation that you had in the past. Say, for example, in uh, modeling language. Uh, if I want to predict the next word in a sentence, it depends on the previous words, the words that I said right now, two words ago, three words ago, the, the sentence before, and so on. If I want to predict a uh, stock price, uh, possibly it depends on the price of yesterday, the day before, even last month. So there are uh, basically uh, situations that your prediction depends on what you have observed in the, in, in the past, depends on the sequence. So the data has temporal order and data has sequential. And we would like to uh, basically take care of this uh, type of data. It's uh, not a new technique. It's introduced in 1986. And uh, in one sense, I, I, I can say that uh, Soon, maybe we don't even need RNN, you know, because there was a paper that that would be the subject of next topic in 2017. Attention, all you need. And basically, by attention, all you mean they meant that you don't need RNN anymore. You know, the only thing that you need is attention, uh, attention mechanism. And then it, it leads to uh, structures like transformers and to take care of sequential data we now mainly use uh, uh, transformers. In some cases, it still we use RNNs and LSTM when data is not sufficient and so on. But anyway, you are going to learn about this. But in, uh, practically, it's mo in most cases, we have a more advanced technique to take care of sequential data, which is transformers, which would be the topic of next lecture. Anyway, it was invented in 1986. And the idea of uh, RNN is that, you know, we learned about feed-forward neural network. And a feed-forward neural network, suppose that you have a word and you want to have a prediction about the word. And we know how to do it with, uh, uh, basically, you know, a feed-forward neural network. Now, suppose that you are in a situation that you have a sequence and the length of the sequence is not fixed. It could be this word and the word before, and this word and 10 words before, or 100 words before that. Anyway, the length of the sequence is not clear. Still, I want to make a prediction. So the main idea of RNN is that, OK, suppose that I have a, a, a fit forward, which can predict uh, this word, a current word, and I have another uh, fit forward, which can predict the word before, and another one which can take the word before that one. Uh, the, the problem with this, and you know, if I have uh, varying length for sequence, I can have as many fit forward as, as I like. But the problem is that they have nothing to do with each other. You know, the, the, the prediction that this RNN will make has nothing to do with the words that I observed before. And to fix that, the idea of RNN is that let's connect the hidden space of these networks together. So basically, when this network wants to make a prediction, it, it predicts based on the current observation, but it also predicts based on the information of the hidden space of uh, the word that I observed before, right? So basically, assume that you have a set of fit forwards, and then you connect their uh, uh, hidden space together. That's going to be RNN. 
So uh, we usually show R and N with uh, this type of diagram. This is, you know, this is just think of this as one feet forward. This is your input. This is the hidden space, and this is the output. Another feed forward input, hidden space output, input hidden space output. Just we make connection between these uh, hidden space. Okay. Uh, these feed forwards networks should have the same weights. Means the weight which the weight which goes from input space to the hidden space and from hidden space to the output space, for all of them should be the same. Also, we make connection between different networks, different hidden spaces. These weights also should be the same. If they are not the same, we can't learn. You know, this is <coughs> because of uh, you know this uh, R and N is just an extension of dynamic systems that has been around for a long time. And the idea of dynamic systems is that you have some states and they're a function which govern uh, the uh, current state based on the previous state. Uh, if this function change over time, you can't learn, you know, it's difference between a stationary and non-stationary dynamic systems. So you need to make some sort of restrictive assumption that the property of the network doesn't change over time. You know, when I go from one state to another state, from a state one to two, have the same sort of function that governs me from two to three. You know, otherwise it's going to be pretty difficult to learn. <coughs> so these type of dynamic systems uh, have sort of uh, Markovian assumption. And Markovian assumption basically means that given current status, past and future are independent. If you tell me ST, I don't need to know ST minus 1. Everything is distilled in ST. Everything from the past is distilled from uh, from the past is still in ST. It's like, uh, you know, if you go for a job interview, for example, uh, they will check, you know, uh, your papers, for example, during your PhD. If you want to get a, a faculty job, for example, you know, they check your publication during your PhD. Uh, they don't check uh, your transcript from elementary school, you know, because the assumption is that what you have done in elementary school, definitely it had some sort of effect in your PhD, but it has been distilled in uh, your PhD, you know. If I know what you have done in your PhD, I don't need to know what you have done in your elementary school, you know. Uh, I can take advantage of that because I didn't do well in my elementary school. <laughs> okay, so uh, th there are some sort of uh, Markovian assumption that knowing the, 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 the current, future, and past are independent from each other. And we have, I mean, you can think of R and N as an extension of this dynamic system that not only, I mean, a state is a function of the previous state, but is also a function of the current observation. <coughs> it's not just a function of the previous state. It's a function of previous state and current uh, observation. You know, that, that makes basically uh, uh, RNN. There are different type of uh, illustration for R and N, you know, that this is, I, I usually de use this type of unfolded uh, illustration, but there is, this one is common also in the literature, which I'm not a, a fan of. Uh, so they show this as, as a loop. Uh, so uh, implicitly, you, you know the, f the, the past, you know, if you have a function, uh, G, for example, 
and this function is a function of current observation and st minus 1, the previous state, then st minus 1 is itself is a function of xt minus 1 and st minus 2. So you can assume that g is a function of xt and uh, xt minus 1 and st minus 2. But this st minus 2 is a function of xt minus 2 and st minus 3 and so on and so forth. So uh, this structure basically implicitly have the information of the past. So if you're handling a language model, for example, with this type of model, it's true that you're conditioning only on the current word and state, previous state, not words. But conditioning on previous state implicitly means that you have conditioned all on, on all words that you have observed so far. Okay? <coughs> Any question? Okay, so um, I told you that this dynamic system, in this dynamic system, you need to share weights. You know, you can't assume that the property of network change over time. Uh, you have to share weights and you have to assume that uh, these W's are fixed over time and V's which are weights from a stage to the output are fixed over time and U's that are weights from input to hidden space are fixed over time. Okay, So they, they are not going to change over time. Okay, so uh, if we come back to, uh, you know, the common understanding that we had from the concept of perceptron, that perceptron had two parts, and the first part was linear summation of the uh, basically previous nodes, and then we had the nonlinearity applied to that. It's going to be exactly the same. You know, you can think, you know, this by this A, I mean the first part of this nodes, the first part of perceptron before we apply nonlinearity to it. So each AT is basically W times ST minus 1 plus U times XT, you know, all weights times, I mean, we have two input for each state. The current observation, the previous state. And they have different set of weights. And this B is just uh, bias, it's optional, you know, always you can have the bias or not have the bias. And then, so this is, that's going to be the first part of this uh, node, which is just weighted sum of every input. And then you are going to apply a nonlinearity to this, which makes uh, uh, ST, and this nonlinearity traditionally is tangent hyperbolic. Not common anymore. You know, usually, you know, we handle this with other type of. Uh, basically activation functions including ReLU, but traditionally it was tangent hyperbolic. And the output is just uh, V times ST again plus a bias. And at the output, usually you're going to have a soft max, which map this to a PT, and PT is going to be a probability vector after the soft max, which we can compare it with one hot vectors that we usually have in classification. Okay. So the uh, structure, I think, is going to be clear. You can make analogy with having a sequence of fit forwards, right? But now the problem is how we can learn this. You know, we, we learn fit forward with back propagation, and we learn fit uh, we learned the convolutional network with back propagation. But uh, we need to think about learning this type of systems. You know, it's not a, it, it, you know, many layers. It's, it's basically something evolved over time, not over layers. Uh, there is extension of back propagation, which is called back propagation uh, through time. 
and using backpropagation through time, we can handle this type of model. <coughs> okay. So, um, maybe I uh, copy this here because it's not going to be clear in the video what we are doing. You know, uh, we are going to have uh, some states and there are W between these states and this is like ST, ST plus 1 and ST minus 1 and there is uh, XT, XT plus 1 and XT minus 1 and there is weights here and through some other set of weights I go to OT plus 1 OT and OT plus 1 this is minus 1 right okay uh, okay this is basically you know the structure that you have and let's assume that L is our loss function okay and I need to take derivative of L with respect to weight W U and V This is uh, sequential, so basically L is a summation of L at time 1, L at time 2, L at time 3, and so on. So it's a summation over time of LT. So instead of taking derivative with respect to uh, W and V and U, I start to compute derivative of L with respect to all of these nodes, S and O, because I'm going to need them when I take derivative with respect to weights. Okay, so uh, let's start with derivative of L with respect to OT. Uh, so derivative of L with respect to OT is in fact derivative of L with respect to LT times derivative of LT with respect to OT. What's derivative of L with respect to LT? It's 1, right? Because the, basically L is summation of all of these L1s, right? So this is 1. Derivative of LT with respect to OT. I can compute that, right? Depends on the form of my L. It's mean a square, it's cross correlation, whatever it is, you know, I can compute this. So it's, it's OK. So I don't have any problem computing derivative of L with respect to OT. Okay, what about derivative of L with respect to ST? Derivative of L with respect to ST is not as easy as this one. Because if you change ST, it changes OT, and it changes ST plus 1. And ST plus 1 by itself changes OT. And each of them will change their corresponding LT, right? And it changes ST plus 2, it changes <laughs> OT plus 2, and so on and so forth. So if you perturb ST, everything else afterward will change in the network. So it's not as easy as the previous one. Let's, let me compute derivative of L with respect capital T when t is end of the time. You know, I just go over time up to the last 
uh, basically last, say not iteration, last time, you know, the end of the time that I want to compute this. So that would be easier because if I change st and t is end of the time, there's nothing after that to be changed. It's going to change only O at that time, right? So this is going to be derivative of L with respect to uh, OT, capital T, times derivative of OT, ST. And derivative of L with respect to OT is computable. Right? Derivative of L with respect to OT is computable. Derivative of OT with respect to ST, what is that? Hmm? V. It's V, right? Because OT is V times ST. So this is going to be V. So, at the end of the time, I can compute this, right? So, what about derivative of L? with respect to S lowercase t when t is not end of the time. So how can I write the change rule here in this case? You know, I'm perturbing this ST. Sorry? can't hear you. Previous hidden state? Why previous hidden state? Yeah, but if I perturb, you know, when you think about chain rule, think this way. I am perturbing this. What's going to happen? It's, it's, it's not going to happen anything in the past. There's going to happen something in the future. Right? If I perturb this, this will change, and this will change, right? So basically, if I perturb ST, uh, OT will change. But that's not the only thing that's going to change. There's another direction of change here. If I perturb ST, ST plus 1 is going to change as well. So plus derivative of L with respect to ST plus 1. So derivative of L with respect to OT, we know how to do this, right? So this is okay. This is okay. Derivative of OT uh, with respect to ST is V plus Derivative of L with respect to ST plus 1. What is it? Hmm? Right yeah, that's what we are doing right now. We don't know, right? So if I call this... Uh, delta t, 
this is basically delta t plus 1. You know, this is something that I don't know. Times derivative of st with respect to st plus 1 with respect to st. Actually, you know, right now you can see where this back propagation over time, uh, through time, uh, comes from. You know, in back propagation, we didn't know uh, how to compute the derivative of this layer, but it, it depends on the next layer. And that one depends on the layer after. That one depends on the layer after. And uh, the last layer we can compute, right? So recursively, we could come back and compute the delta of all layers. Same thing here, that if you want to compute delta at time t, it depends on time t plus 1. And times t plus 1 depends on time t plus 2, and so on and so forth, up to the end of the time. And end of the time, you know how to compute, right? So we can back, basically back propagate and find, um, find all deltas recursively. That, that's the idea, the main idea of back propagation through time. So now I have to compute the derivative of st plus 1 with respect to st. And st plus 1 with respect to st, st plus 1 is basically w uh, times st, right? So it is uh, it is w times st, so it's going to be w, right? OK. But the main job is to take the derivative of L with respect to these weights, U, W, and V. So the derivative of L with respect to V. Uh, so if I change V, uh, O will, will, will it, it affects O, right? So the derivative of L with respect to V is basically the derivative of L with respect to uh, O at time T times the derivative of OT with respect to V sum over all time. Right? It's because if I change V, it changes output at time t, it changes output at time t plus 1, it changes time output in, in all times. So summation over all times, the derivative of L with respect to OT times the derivative of OT with respect to V, and the derivative of L with respect to OT, we know how to compute, right? So that's okay. What's the derivative of OT with respect to V? It's just st, right? So that's OK. <coughs> derivative of L with respect to uh, w. If I change w, it changes s only, right? So basically, I can write it as derivative of L with respect to st times derivative of st with respect to w, and again, summation over time. What's the derivative of l with respect to st? Derivative of l with respect to st, we can compute recursively. So that's OK. Derivative of st with respect to w. Hmm? Is it t minus 1? What is this? You know, st is what? Is w st minus 1, right? Uh, but this st minus 1 itself 
is a function of W, right? So it's basically some nonlinear function of A t minus 1. And A t minus 1 is W uh, some S plus U some X plus B, right? But, but anyway, this is computable, right? Because it's, it's just you have some sort of nonlinear function applied to uh, W of the previous state, and you can compute this. So it's OK to compute. <coughs> and derivative of L with respect to U. Derivative of L with respect to U, basically, if I change U, I'm going to change ST, so it's summation over T of derivative of L with respect to ST times <coughs> derivative of ST with respect to uh, U. Derivative of L with respect to ST is computable. And derivative of ST with respect to uh, U is what? It's just your input, right? It's, it's also computable. <coughs> so uh, basically with this recursion and with knowing the fact that at the end of the time I can compute this quantity, Everything would be okay, very similar to backpropagation, and it's called backpropagation through time. If you uh, look at the slides of the course, I assume that this uh, activation function is tangent hyperbolic. And uh, just to make it clear, you know, when you take the derivative of the activation function, Tangent hyperbolic, the, what's the derivative of tangent hyperbolic? It is, do you remember? What is that? So it's 1 minus tangent hyperbolic squared. Okay? So basically, if you look at the slides, you're going to have uh, 1 minus tangent hyperbolic is squared of the u, and when u is just w s plus u x plus b, which is just one of the states, it's not really that important, you know, because it's one type of tangent hyperbolic, but I just want to make it clear for you if, if you look at the slides. Because there's something which it's not easy to capture with why it, it, it happens. Um, you know, this, uh, you know, a state is a vector. ST plus 1 is a vector. You're taking the derivative of this vector, ST plus 1, with respect to previous state, which is T. What would be the uh, derivative? Is it a vector? Is it a matrix? What is it? It is, sorry? It's a matrix, right? If I take the derivative of a scalar with respect to a vector, derivative is? Vector. A vector, right? Because the derivative of a scalar with respect to vector means that if I perturb the first element of this vector, this is going to change. If I perturb the second element of the vector, this is going to change. So there are d different directions of change if my vector is d-dimensional. So the derivative of a scalar with respect to vector is a vector. The derivative of vector with respect to a vector is matrix. Because you know, if I perturb this, all of these are going to change. If I perturb this, all of them are going to change, right? So if it's D, this is D, it's going to be D by D direction of changes. So the derivative of vector with respect to vector is matrix. So this is going to be a matrix 
But if you look at the uh, slides, we have diag 1 minus st squared. The reason is that between a state s and a state s plus 1, the connection is like uh, point-wise. You know, if, if the connection is point-wise, you know, if it's not fully connected, it means that, okay, derivative of this with respect to this is a matrix, but in this matrix, anything off diagonal is zero, right? Only diagonal's value have uh, basically have to have effect because it's not fully connected. You know, if I change this, only this one is going to change. If I change this, only this one is going to change. So it's a matrix, but it's a matrix that all of diagonals are zero. So we can write it as diagonal of that matrix. So if you look at the literature of uh, RNN and you see this, that, that's the reason. Or in the slides, that's the reason. Okay. Any question? That's what I meant, you know, when you see this diag, that's the, that's the reason. Uh, okay, uh, everything seems fine on paper now that we can compute the derivative of st at the end of the time and then we have a recursive function which can compute this derivatives uh, for, the, for the previous state, so everything seems fine. But in practice, we are facing two important problems. One of them is vanishing gradient, and the other one is exploding gradient. This is not just for RNN, you know, we had the problem of vanishing gradient in fit forward and CNN, whenever you have many layers, you are going to have the problem of vanishing gradient and exploding gradient. And that's basically the, the reason that if you think of a network with many layers, uh, it's a composition function, right? The first layer is a function over input. And the next layer is a function over the output of the first layer. So if you call the first layer f of x, the next layer would be g of f of x, right? So uh, so if the first layer is f of x, the next layer is going to be g of f of x, right? So it's G O F X, right? And the next layer would be another function G of F of X. So eventually you have a composition function in the form of uh, F of F of F of F, right? Uh, that's for a network with many layers, but that's also the case for R and N. You know, because each a step is a function of the previous a step. It's not over layers, it's over time, you know. Time capital T, O time capital T minus 1, and so on, <laughs> up, up to the first time. So, what would be the derivative of G of F of X? Right? It's going to be derivative of f 
times derivative of g of f of x. So as if we multiply derivatives of this function together, right? When you have a composition function and you're taking derivative, it's as if you're multiplying the derivatives of these functions together. And in fact, you can exactly write it as the multiplication of derivatives with these uh, <coughs> assumptions, you know. If you assume that f prime is derivative of f with respect to x and f prime t is ft with respect to x, and if you define a of this form, then the final derivative can be written as the multiplication of all of these derivatives. Even in, in deep network, even if layers are smooth, composition of them may not be smooth. In RNN, even if you're uh, at, at, at time t, you have a smooth function, it's not clear that over time it's going to be a smooth because it's, it's going to be, you know, a, a composition function. So, um, What's going to happen is that, you know, just for simplicity, we have the multiplication of some derivatives. For simplicity, just assume that it's a constant number, alpha. And you're taking alpha to the power of capital T, you know, because alpha times alpha times alpha T times. If alpha is less than one, it's gonna approach to zero. And if alpha is greater than one, it's gonna approach to infinity. So if you have enough layers in a neural network, or if you have, if you go, if you have R and N and you uh, run it for enough time length, <coughs> the derivative is going to vanish, approach to zero, or is going to explode approach to infinity. And that's two significant problem, you know. That was one of the uh, main reason that 20 something years ago, people lost their attention to neural network because they, they faced vanishing gradient. They didn't know how to fix the vanishing gradient and they were not able to train a network with many layers. So neural network was two, three, four layers at, at, at most. And you know, when you don't have a network with many layers, it's not going to generalize well. You know, you can uh, change the width, but it, it's gonna overfit. It's not going to generalize. If you want to generalize, you need many layers. We are not able to train network with many layers. So it, it took more than 20 years, besides many other changes, you know, changes in data, changes in um, computation and, and so on, but also, you know, taking care of this problem of managing grade. Uh, so that's the problem in deep network and that's the problem in RNN. And uh, so what's the idea to solve this problem? There has been many different ideas in the literature of RNN to solve this problem. Some of those uh, ideas have been adopted recently for deep networks. Because in the past that was the, the problem only for RNN, you know, because fit forward and CNN was only two, three, layers, but um, that was, a, that, that was a, a, a real problem for R RNN. <clears throat> so one of the uh, ideas to, to handle this is called equistate network, okay? So it's the idea of equistate network. You know, I gave you example of vanishing gradient and uh, exploding gradient when we have scalar as the, the gradient of, you know, f and f prime, I mean, uh, function f. In uh, RNN, 
we have basically we are taking derivative with respect to a matrix W, for example, which is going from one layer to another layer. And this is not a scalar, it's a matrix. Jacobian is a matrix, right? And uh, so we have a well understanding of what's happening in terms of vanishing. You know, we have small scalar less than one and it goes, you know, to the power of t and t goes to infinity and it goes to zero. But what's going to happen if you have a matrix is Jacobian. If you have a matrix, something completely similar is going to happen. You know, if you uh, change your state by delta, and suppose uh, you do eigen decomposition on Jacobian, it has some eigenvalues and has some eigenvectors, and suppose that you make changes on delta along the one of these eigen vectors what would be the change of delta s you know it's matrix times this vector and you have the eigen vector and you have eigen value right so the changes over this vector is if if lambda is eigenvalue and V is eigenvectors, it's going to be lambda delta S, right? In the first iteration. And the second, if, if I go through this direction, direction of this eigenvector, in the next iteration is going to be lambda squared and lambda cubic and so on and so forth. And eventually it's going to be lambda to the power of T. So exactly the same scenario for scalar function is going to happen here. You know, if eigenvalues corresponding to eigenvector of this Jacobian is less than one, it's going to vanish. And if it's more than one, it's going to explode. Okay, so the idea of uh, echo state network was that we need some sort of Jacobian that uh, its eigenvalue is not significantly less than one or significantly more than one. It's close to one, but and in, in practice they wanted them to be uh, slightly less than one. Slightly less than one, you know, vanishing gradient, what vanishing gradient means in practice. Vanishing gradient in practice means that you're going to forget the past, right? So gradient becomes small, small, small. At some point, it's not trustable. And if it becomes a, a small after like five time step, means you completely forgot what's happening, happened in basically five time step before. And if you are making a question answering model, for example, and you had a couple of sentences that, um, you know, if I tell you that uh, University of Waterloo built 50 years ago and the founder, the main founder who uh, raised found was this person and um, you know, he went store to store, collect money, and tell you some stories coming to now, and then tell you that now, at the moment, University of Waterloo has this number of buildings and this number of faculties and so on. And then ask you, who was the founder of University of Waterloo? Who mainly raised funds for University of Waterloo? You totally forgot, you know, because uh, the, the gradient vanished, you know, and you don't have access to that information anymore. So that's, that's basically the problem of vanishing gradient in practice, right? So the idea is that design W in a way that uh, vanishing gradient happens later. Means happens later, how, it, how it's possible it happens later. If the eigenvalue is close to one, 
if it's close to one, it's slightly less than one, eventually it's going to vanish. But after not five steps, maybe 50 steps, right? Still, I'm, I'm, I'm remembering what happened, you know, in 50 sentences before. And if it's slightly more than one, it's going to explode, but later, you know. That's the, basically the main idea. Uh, I'm missing one slide here, maybe, but I can explain to you verbally. There, there, there are uh, relatively new works. Relatively means it's around 2015 and some variations, 2017. That uh, they, this, uh, 16, they, they design RNN such that W is just identity. They don't connect themselves to the idea of equistate network, but it is equistate network, right? It's exactly the idea of equistate network. So, uh, in fact, the idea is that you don't need to learn W. Assume that W is identity. What is the role of W, you know? Uh, in each state, ST plus one, or each state, ST, in fact was W S T minus one plus U uh, X T plus some bias. And now that assume that W is identity, if W is identity, uh, I assume that the previous state, and then, then I have a nonlinear function here, is current observation plus the previous state not a function of previous state, not a, a transformation of the previous, the previous state, exactly. But what, what I wanted this for, you know, I wanted this for to implicitly have access to the information from the past, right? I wanted this because st plus one was a function of xt minus one and st minus two. So it is a still a function of x t minus one, x t minus one, and t minus two, right? So I put the weight of prediction only on u and v, and I assume that w is not a parameter; it's fixed, it's identity from one state to another state. It helps vanishing gradient a lot because the eigenvalues are going to be one. So the chance of vanishing is much less, okay? So that's basically the idea of, the old idea of equistate network with some new variations of that which assume that W is identity. Another old idea is long delays. And long delays is pretty similar to the idea which reinvented in uh, residual networks. We uh, slightly uh, briefly mentioned residual networks in CNN and residual network basically was to skip uh, some of the layers and make direct connection uh, from you know one layer not to the next layer but to layer after. That's exactly the same you know a state is usually just a function of the previous state, but let's assume that st, or say st plus one, uh, is a function of st through this path, but is a function of st minus one as well, okay, through another function. It, it likes, uh, you know, we are breaking the Manila Markovian assumption here, you know, I go to job interview, they look at my papers from PhD, but they also ask me, how is your bachelor's? Where did you do your bachelor's? You know, it's your transcript there. Uh, because maybe the assumption is here that, you know, maybe you did your PhD in a lousy university, you know, and you can show a good transcript, but if you don't have a solid background in your bachelor's, it doesn't mean anything, right? 
so it's not distilled completely here. You know, I, I need also to know something about your past directly without the assumption that it has been already distilled in your PhD. Th this sort of idea, right? So it, it helps vanishing gradient. In which sense it helps vanishing gradient? In the sense that even if gradient get vanished during this path, it's still I have direct access to the information in the past, right? So for example, if I am in a regime that after five steps, gradient is going to vanish, through these paths, it's as if after 10 steps, I'm going to forget, you know, because I always have inf ac direct access not only to the previous state, but to two steps before. Okay. So this is called leaky delay. And as I said, it has been reinvented somehow in, um, you know, modern neural networks with adding some residual uh, networks. <coughs> So uh, that was the idea, the way that it has been implemented uh, traditionally in leaky units is that, okay, we know that ST is a nonlinear function of ST minus one plus some functions or some transformation of the current observation. And let's uh, define a new variable tau and make a convex combination between uh, st minus one plus ux, which is current state, and st minus one. So I'm gonna make a convex combination of the current state and previous state through a new parameter tau. And this tau goes between one and infinity. If it is one, this part is going to be zero, and I only have the current state, right? If tau is going to infinity, then I'm going to have information only about, I mean, if it's go to infinity, then, um, sorry, if it is one, this is going to be zero, right? If it's infinity, this is going to be one, and this is going to be zero. So infinity means its current state is previous state. One means completely forget the previous state. Current state is current state. Only depends on observation, the current observation, right? So basically, but different values of this tau tell me that should I forget the past or not, right? Or I, I need the information from the past to be around. You know, all of my examples was, were cases that uh, forgetting the future, forgetting the past was problematic. That's not always the case. You know, I'll give you examples that uh, maybe you don't need to, to have information about the, the past, you know. It's a sort of redundant information. If I give you a sequence of... Uh, if I give you a sequence of uh, A and Bs, and my question is that the number of A that we have observed so far is even or odd, right? So we, you can just set a counter and then I have, this is odd, 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 even, odd, you know? If here you ask me this question, that the number of odds that have been observed so far is even or odd, I don't need to remember everything, you know. I just, I can count over time. So there are cases that um, you need the past information to be around. There are cases that you don't need the information of the past to be around, you know. And it's redundant. <laughs> uh, this tau actually is not just one scalar, it's in, with the length of your state. If a state is d-dimensional, p-dimensional, this tau is p-dimensional, 
as if you apply one scalar to each uh, position of S. You know, this is S. And tau 1 will be applied to this. Tau 2 will be applied to this. Means I have flexibility of uh, changing the values of a state in a sense that it's going to be the current states, current only a state for getting the past. It depends only on current observation. Or it's only the previous state has nothing to do with the current observation or a linear combination of these two. Okay, So by defining this new variable, I, I add this flexibility to the model. And uh, this is basically called leaky state. So I told you, you know, I just gave you this example that there are cases that you don't need to remember what happened in the past. Uh, this is basically, I mean, combination of these two ideas that at some points you need to forget, at some points you need to remember. This is the intuition behind models, which is called gated models. And gated models are not just vanilla RNN, they're sort of variations of RNN. The most famous one is LSTM, long short term memory. Okay. Uh, LSTM turned out to be quite complicated in terms of the number of gates that it has. And more recently, some researchers decided that we define too many gates. And by gates, which I'm going to explain in a moment, by gates I mean, you know, uh, something similar to this tau, ways to forget or remember, you know, like a gate which let the information of the past go through or block it. Okay. So they decided that uh, LSTM is too complicated uh, network in terms of the gates that introduce and maybe we don't need that and they came up with more simpler way more simpler gated networks and the, there are many many variations of that and the most famous one is GRU which you are going to see in a moment uh, So LSTM itself introduced in 1997. And uh, there was a paper in 2015 by the author of 1997, 17 paper, listed important variations of his work. And there were 20 different variations of LSTM by 2015. I um, don't think it's going to be a hot research area anymore because after 2017, we have transformers, you know. So we have better ways to handle this. Uh, but at least we have 20-something variations of LSTM, 20-something important variations of LSTM. And uh, <coughs> these, are, these are some. And in 2014, the idea of GRU introduced gated uh, recurrent unit, which is one type of gated network. And this one also has many variations, you know, again. Uh, I'm going to introduce the, the vanilla um, GRU first. It comes later, but I'm going to first introduce GRU because it has less number of gates and then LSTM is just more complicated than GRU with many other gates. I mean, the idea of GRU is that you don't need that many gates, you know, you can handle this easier. 
So if you look at the literature, there are many diagrams when they try to show GRU or LSTM. These are a subset of those, right? Personally, I can't make any sense of any of them, you know. <laughs> and, and the fact that there are many different diagrams to show LSTM and they're very different from each other, I think the main reason is that many people have the same feeling as I do. You know, they look at this diagram and they can't make sense of that and they come up with another diagram which they think is better and then the next person the same, you know, and then we have hundred different diagrams to show LSTM and GRU and it's quite overwhelming. So my suggestion is that don't look at diagrams and just look at the formula, math, it's much easier than these uh, diagrams. Okay, that's what's happening in GRU. <coughs> that is uh, what's going to happen in GRU. <coughs> This is a standard RNN, right? It's a standard RNN, WST minus one plus UXT, and a nonlinear function. In GRU, assume that you have defined a new set of weights, new set of W and new set of U, okay? In fact, you have defined two new set of Ws and two new set of Us. So uh, in RNN, you have U from X to S and W from ST minus one to, w to, to this. I have another set of W, another set of W, another set of U, another set of U. Okay, so as if I have in total three sets of U and three sets of W. Okay, uh, the, the, the W and U, originally, we know what the function is. So, uh, I'm going to define a new set of, uh, basically, weights in order to forget and another set of weights in order to remember, you know. Uh, I call one of them UZ, the other one UR. So we have three sets, U, UZ, and UR. And then uh, this Z is update gates for the case that we want to keep the information around. And R is reset gates for the case that we want to forget. And then we are going to define a temporary state. And this temporary state is a combination, I mean this R is a parameters and it's, this is pairwise with WST minus one. So if you think of WST minus one as a vector and R is a vector of the same size and there's pairwise connection and R is going to knock down some of these nodes and keep some of them or in, intensify some of them. And this R is going to be learned through this function. So basically you learn some of U's and W's which lead to R and R <coughs> is a vector which is going to knock down some of the values of your current state. Uh, and your final, okay, so after this, you know, this, this temporary state is your state after you forgot something from the past because this reset gate has been applied to it. Some of them have been knocked down, some of them have been forgotten. And but information of the current state, as usual, have been applied to it, you know, and uh, nonlinearity has been applied to this. Now, this is temporary. My real current state 
is a linear combination of update gates applied to the uh, this, this temporary current state and my previous state. So think of this. We are going to learn R and Z this way with this new set of weights. The role of R is to knock down some of the information from the past. Some of the information from the past have been forgotten in this temporary state. Now I have another Z, another variable, which is for you know, being aware of the past. It's not for reset, it's for update. And then I make a, a, a linear combination for the past and current. And uh, this linear combination will tell me basically how much information of the past should be incorporated to the new one. So if I want to summarize, you have this ZT and RT, which is going to be learned through two new set of weights. And then you have a temporary weights, which basically pairwise let you to forget something. And the, you have something uh, which uh, the update weights, which make you a linear combination from the past and the uh, basically temporary current state. Definitely, it's not a straightforward. And it's not intuitive. Um, if you have a good intuition about this, I, I personally don't, you know. Uh, and you may uh, ask this question that, that how they came up with this idea of combining this. They came up with this idea through many, many different experience and seeing many, many different needs over time, you know. And uh, cases that you need something from the past will help. Cases that you, don't, you need to forget, cases that you need to make the memory around and so on and so forth, you know, it, it, it leads to this, uh, basically, uh, the idea of de defining a gate to forget and the gate to, to update. <coughs> uh, if you look at LSTM, it has many more gates, you know, it, it was just GRU with these two gates. It has many more gates with these type of parameters, which uh, I think if you just look at this slide, you don't need any more information. These are these, these type of gates only is going to be applied. In terms of practice, uh, you don't need to do anything extra, you know, because these are like blocks. Blocks of R and N take uh, previous state and current observation and produce a next state and some output. Blocks are GRU are exactly the same. Blocks or LSTMs are exactly the same. Uh, but what's happening inside these blocks is somehow different. The, the vanilla RNN was only one set of U and W, and blocks of GRU has two more set of U's and W's, and blocks of LSTM have even more set of these weights and more gates. Uh, to handle the problem of vanishing and exploding and forgetting and not forget. Okay, any question? Yes? We are learning? Yes. We, cal we calculate ST in forward pass, not in backward pass. In forward pass, you have ST, you have ST, you have ST minus one, you have ST, you have ST plus one in forward pass. In backward pass, you're updating the weights only. 